agenda. Uh, I will pass the mic to Dr. Farish to moderate the seminar. And I would like to call all the learned speakers to be on the stage. Uh, please welcome Dr. Farish Aino, Dr. Haida Bagir, uh, Prof. Karim Crow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for joining us today for today's discussion. I think there's been an uh, agreement on the part of all of the speakers uh, that we can perhaps dispense with the long introductions. Everyone's got Facebook accounts now, so if you want to know who's who, just go to the internet. Um, uh, I'll take a cue from the opening speech by Professor Hashim Ali. Um, we are here to discuss uh, the issue of sectarianism and Islam under the general topic of Islam without sectarianism. Um, allow me to simply state, uh, make one simple point in observation of this uh, uh, point before we continue. Um, I do not think that there is a contradiction, nor is it impossible to reconcile the <coughs> concept of Tawheed, the notion of uh, unity of creation with the reality of difference. Uh, this is a point that uh, as the Mali has, has raised at the beginning. Uh, difference in itself has not been problematic, uh, not in Muslim society or not in any societies, but we are talking about sectarianism here. And so perhaps we should understand what we mean by sectarianism and why it has come to be seen as problematic by many Muslims living in the contemporary Muslim world. We're talking about divisions that are not necessarily natural. Uh, these are not divisions in the same way that a movement of the earth would create a valley and hills. We're talking about the visions that are man-made, uh, that are manufactured and engineered. We're talking about the visions that are accompanied with, are accompanied by a vocabulary of division, and, and which leads us then to the politics of sectarianism. So in our discussion on sectarianism and on Islam, I think you cannot um, deny or, or neglect this fact that we are also talking about images of power vocabularies of uh, identification and difference, which can, unfortunately, as we have seen in the experience of the 20th and 21st century, sometimes uh, propel Muslim communities to forms of politics and political organization that leads to you know, uh, conflict, um, disagreements, violent disagreements within the Muslim Muna itself. To discuss this theme of Islam without sectarianism, of course, we have three prominent speakers hopefully you have agreed uh, to allow me to simply uh, invite them to speak without the long um, formalities of, of, uh, 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 of describing their, their entire CVs. Uh, they are known to all of us here as experts in their field. I would like to take this opportunity to therefore invite uh, to address all of us, um, Professor Said Tariq Rabbas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, first of all, I, I would like to, to thank uh, the um, Islamic Renaissance Front and Islamic Book Trust for inviting us to this uh, seminar and also to commend them for their bravery in um, raising or allowing us to raise sensitive issues. Um, if you look at the uh, books um, that have been displayed outside, um, you find that Islamic Book Trust has um, um, a good range of works, both by uh, Sunni as well as uh, Shiite uh, scholars, um, which is, I think, something commendable and that we should um, um, encourage. Um, all the more because things are developing in, you know, around the world um, when it comes to Sunni-Shiite conflict. Um, in the uh, last few years, the last few decades actually, um, we have seen bloody conflicts between uh, Sunnis and Shiites in Iraq, in, in uh, Pakistan, um, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, um, in Indonesia even. Um, and although we have, not, uh, we have not experienced or witnessed um, violent conflicts in Malaysia, we should be aware that things are developing in a very dangerous way 
in Malaysia. Um, first of all, it may not be known to everyone that Malaysia um, officially does not recognize the Ja'fari school or the Shiite, the major 12 Shiite school as uh, an official uh, or we could say legitimate mazhab or school, jurisprudential school of thought. Um, the fatwa committee of the uh, National Council of Islamic Affairs in the 1990s only recognized the, the four Sunni madhabs as uh, legitimate madhabs. Uh, now this has to be understood in the context of a gradual demonization of Shiites in, uh, in Malaysia. Um, see, on the one hand, you have the majority of Malaysians who are more or less ignorant about Shiism, and on the other hand, you have an intolerant uh, uh, legalistic approach towards um, Shiism, and that takes place in the context of um, hostility. Um, as far as the authorities are concerned. So you had, for example, I think it was in 2010, uh, the arrest of Malaysian Shiites during the commemoration of the murder of uh, Sayyidina Hussein at Karbala. Uh, Shiites commemorate this every year uh, during the month of uh, Muharram, um, particularly on the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. Um, and during this, um, this occasion, uh, in 2010, if I'm if not mistaken, um, the, um, in Selangor, the Jabatan Agama Islam Selangor um, had uh, facilitated their arrest and um, they were charged with, it seems, having been against um, the ruling of the Fatwa Committee. Um, we've also seen some TV programs uh, that have actually spread, um, uh, we could even say lies, about, about Shiites. Uh, and again, this is, must be seen in the larger context of um, um, stereotypes that seem to circulate among Sunnis, not only in Malaysia, but also in other parts of the, of the world, um, which I would like to, um, to mention later. So what I want to discuss in, uh, in this few minutes that I have is the, our problematic attitude, when I say our, I mean the attitude of the Sunni majority towards Shiism. The problematic attitude that we have and how this problematic attitude is at odds with the spirit of, of Islam. So I've mentioned to you just now the, uh, uh, the stereotyping, the demonization of Shiism and the intolerant attitude that we take legally towards, uh, towards Shiism. Now this should be con contrasted with uh, the, the spirit of Islam that was displayed even in this country in the past. For example, one of the muftis from Malaysia, probably one of the, the most well-known muftis, um, Habib Alwi bin Tahir al-Haddad, mufti of Johor, uh, in the early part of, the, century, of the, the last century, not only regarded the Shiites as, um, uh, as a legitimate the Ja'fari school as a legitimate school, but there's a very, very interesting um, historical event that took place concerning his relationship with the, the Shiites. And that event has to be, again, contrasted with a very bigoted and close-minded um, you know, approach that some Malaysians have towards, uh, towards Shiism. Um, in, uh, during that period, I, th I believe this would have been in the 19, the, the first uh, pre-World War uh, II period. Um, Habib Alwi bin Tahir al-Haddad, the Mufti of Johor, gave an ijaza, which you know refers to um, uh, a permission to recite or to, to, um, to convey a jaza riwaya of, of a hadith to one of the most prominent Shiite Iranian Ayatollahs, Ayatollah Marashi Najafi. Um, Ayatollah Marashi Najafi uh, is, um, was a famous uh, uh, Shiite cleric who, among other things, established the public library uh, known as uh, the Marashi Najafi uh, Public Library in Qom. This is an amazing library um, which was started as a personal collection 
by Ayatollah Marashi Najafi, consisting of uh, um, more than 200,000 um, uh, books, um, among them thousands and thousands of manuscripts in Arabic, in Persian, and even some in, uh, in Latin and other European languages. Um, and it also includes in the basement of this uh, library um, what they call uh, um, Bimaristana Kitab in Persian, which means uh, uh, a book hospital. Because this, uh, this um, section is for the repair of uh, manuscripts, of even very old manuscripts, which are expertly refer re repaired by um, technicians as well as artists. Because when we talk about the repair of manuscripts, the, you, al you also have to take into account the color, the designs, the, the artwork that was done on the books and on the pages of these manuscripts. Anyway, that itself is another you know, topic of, uh, of discussion. Uh, but what you have is a major mufti from, from uh, well, in those days, uh, Malaya, from Johor, a major mufti from this region, and also a major scholar of that period from this region, who gave an ijazah to uh, a major Shiite uh, cleric. This is a very important event, because you do not give an ijazah to somebody whom you do not recognize. You do not give an ijazah to a scholar who belongs to a madhab or religion that you do not recognize and regard as legitimate. So this is a very important event. Contrast that with the view that we do not recognize the Ja'fari, a major madhab in Islam and Islamic history, as legitimate. Worse still, we spread stereotypes about them uh, and we even arrest them for being what they are. Um, and I have to add, I, I, I really have to add and I really wish our authorities would uh, take a note of this that we are becoming Malaysia, is becoming a laughing stock in the international Islamic community. Because no serious Muslim scholar demonizes and victimizes and considers as non legitimate the Shiite school. This really has to be to be to be understood. Um, don't forget, Shiites go to Hajj. They are accepted and received in Saudi Arabia to go to Hajj. No non-Muslim may attend the Hajj. Iran is a member of the OIC. Right? Now we can go on. Um, we know, for example, in the 20th century, even in the 19th century, the major Muslim scholars, the Sunni, the major scholars of the Sunni world um, have declared openly, publicly, and in their writings that the school of uh, the Ja'fari school uh, or the Twelver Shiite school is a legitimate school within Islam. Um, I just have, you know, I can give, give you a list of names. Maybe the most famous, most well known is uh, Sheikh Al Azhar uh, um, uh, Shaltut, uh, Mahmoud Shaltut, who um, declared that in, uh, in a very famous um, fatwa of his, um, um, which I believe uh, in 1959, which, which appeared in 1959, published um, um, in a work called Risalat al-Islam. Um, but then you also have Sheikh uh, Muhammad Abdu, who lived from 1894 to 1905. You have uh, Sheikh Salim Bishri, uh, also born in the 19th century, you have uh, uh, Muhammad al-Madani at the earlier part of the 20th century who, who actually was associated with Dar al-Taqrib, um, this organization that is meant to bring together uh, the various madhahib. Um, you have uh, uh, Said Sabiq, you have uh, Mahmoud Shaltud I mentioned, Abdul Azim Zarqani, you have Hassan Al-Banna, the famous Hassan Al-Banna, you have uh, Muhammad Ghazali, the, uh, the, 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 the famous scholar of the, um, uh, he, uh, born in 1916, died in 1996, he was a student of uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Shaltut. Uh, you have uh, Muhammad uh, Sheikh Sharawi, uh, you have uh, Muhammad uh, Said Tantawi Al-Azhar, and many others. In fact, you would not find a serious Muslim scholar, Sunni scholar, um, who is not an extremist, we can of course talk about what, how we define extremism, who would define Shiites as not legitimate, right? Um, so again, 
Contrast that with the stereotypes that are being spread about Shiites, even on Malaysian TV, that they have their own Quran, that um, they uh, consider Sayyidina Ali as a prophet, and so on and so forth. These are very popular stereotypes spread among um, the common people, but sometimes believed by even people who present themselves to us as scholars um, and are trafficked, you know, the trafficking of, uh, of stereotypes. Um, we don't have time to go into all the details and to explain what the tenets of Shiism are and why um, um, their beliefs, the beliefs of the Shiites are, um, are legitimate. We may have certain disagreements uh, uh, with Shiites with regard to the interpretation of history. There may be ikhtilaf, you know, as Professor Hashim Kamali was mentioning, uh, you know, the, the concept of ikhtilaf, which uh, uh, the, the, the differences that are tolerated, permitted, sometimes even celebrated, because they add to the diversity of the, of the ummah in terms of its uh, rational thought, in terms of its culture, and so on. Um, so there may be differences, but um, uh, these di differences, as I said, are accepted and acceptable among the major scholars of Islam. Um, but more than that, I think it's very important for us as Sunnis to realize that there is a lot that we need to learn from Shi'ism. I'd just like to mention a few things. You know, there is a famous, uh, famous uh, hadith, uh, Thakalain, um, which in which the Prophet um, had said that he leaves behind two great things. Um, two great things. You know, two... Um, well, Thakal, I suppose it means like heavy, literally. So two very uh, weighty things, exactly. Um, these two weighty things are the book of Allah, the Quran, and the other one is the family of the Prophet. My family, in other words, his, uh, the Prophet said, the Ahl al-Bayt. Of course, referring to um, the five, you know, uh, Sayyidina Hassan, Sayyidina Hussein, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina, uh, Sayyidina Fatima, and the Prophet. Uh, uh, the, so the five members of the Ahl al-Bayt. Um, what this means is, the, it is important, if these are the two weighty things or the two great things that were left behind, it means that we have to take these things seriously, the Qur'an as well as the, the Ahl al-Bayt. Now when we say taking the Ahl al-Bayt seriously, we mean taking, we don't mean um, worshipping them, but we mean taking their lives seriously because they were living during the time of the Prophet, they were part of his household, and their thoughts, their views, and their conduct are worthy of serious consideration by us and worthy of serious study by us, along with the other Sahaba of the Prophet. I mean, nobody among the Sunnis would say that we may just simply discount the Sahaba and not be interested in them. But the same serious attitude should be taken towards the, the Ahl al-Bayt, um, especially since they were the closest to the Prophet and they are a source of information about the source, they are a source of, uh, you know, of facts concerning the Prophet's um, sunnah, prof concerning his deeds and his, his sayings. Um, and we see that um, it is more in the Shiite tradition that the history and the traditions concerning the Ahl al-Bayt have been uh, kept alive, recorded, passed down from generation to generation. Um, among the Sunnis, we suffer from what we might call a historical amnesia. In other words, we have forgotten some of those weighty things. In this country, for example, on Ashura, a lot of Malaysians, a lot of uh, Muslims in this country, forgot about what actually happened historically on Ashura. Because we, we, we commemorate or celebrate all kinds of things that are supposed to have happened on Ashura, such as the landing of uh, the Ark of Nabi Noh and, and many other events that are, sp are said to have happened. But hardly anybody remembers Karbala. You see, this is a problem. The, the, in terms of what happened in Ashura, 
uh, like the landing of Noah's Ark and the, the, the saving of Nabi Ibrahim from fire and so on and so forth. These are, these are, are legends. They, know, they have no basis in history for these things. Uh, the only thing that has basis in history is the murder of Sayyidina Hussein at Karbala on Ashura. Um, but we have forgotten about it. Um, but it is commemorated by the Shiites. Of course, there are ways in which Shiites commemorate this that many Sunnis, and even Shiites themselves, are uncomfortable with. Such as, you know, flagellation of the body with iron chains, iron chains uh, until bleeding and so on. Well, we don't agree with that. In fact, in Iran itself, uh, it is not, it is frowned upon, right? Um, but what we're, we're not talking about how we commemorate. We're talking about whether it is important to commemorate a very important event in which the grandson of the Prophet was murdered along with um, several of his family members and uh, uh, companions. Why was he murdered? Because he refused to give allegiance to a caliph who was, whose minor sins were womanizing and uh, adultery, but was also implicated in some massacres when he was caliph. And thank God that Sayyidina Hussein refused to give the allegiance. Because if he did, where would Muslims today hide their face? Because we would have to uh, explain to the rest of the world and to ourselves that why did the grandson of the Prophet give allegiance to such a man, to be a Khalifa? So this has nothing to do with being Shiites or Sunnis. It's got to do with being good people, recognizing justice and injustice. So as Sunnis, as Muslims, as good Muslims, we should not forget about the good things and the bad things that happen in our history, especially when it comes to figures such as you know, uh, the Prophet uh, and the household of the Prophet, and indeed anyone, right? Indeed, the reason why we should remember Sayyidina Hussein is not because he was the grandson of the Prophet, but because he died for a very important cause. Um, this is something we can learn from, from the Shiites. Um, Now, I think it's also important to point out that there are aspects of Shiite traditions and practices which are really part of the customs of Shiites. And we may be uncomfortable with those things. Indeed, there are aspects of the practice and customs of Arab Sunnis in the Middle East that we don't practice and that we're not comfortable with. These are, these are the minor issues, uh, then they have not to do with Islam as a deen, but they have to do with the, maybe with the urf or the, the adat, as we say in Malay, of uh, different Muslim communities around the world. So some we may accept, in, in which we have indeed accepted in this part of the world, and some we have not accepted. Um, but we shouldn't confuse the adat of Shiites, or Iranian Shiites, or Iraqi Shiites, with uh, Shiism uh, as a school of thought as a philosophical school of thought, as a theological school of thought, and as a jurisprudential school of thought. We should, not, to, we should not confuse these things. We should also realize that there are many parallels between Islam in Southeast Asia, in the Malay world, and uh, um, uh, Islam as it is understood and practiced among uh, the Shiites. Uh, I don't have time to go into this, but you know in many parts of uh, Southeast Asia, there is the uh, Praya Antabut, you know, which has to do with the procession and this come a procession of uh, what do you call funeral procession commemoration during Ashura. Um, we find this in Aceh and various parts of Sumatra and uh, uh, in other parts of Indonesia, even in parts of Semenanja of the Malay uh, Peninsula. Um, and this shows that the, that at one point in time in history, um, there, there were probably was uh, a Shiite. Uh, uh, there must have been a Shiite community in uh, this part of the world. And in fact, we do have descendants of uh, Shiite um, uh, in the Malay world. Uh, today in Malaysia, we do have descendants of earlier Shiites. Uh, we do have many Shiites among the Malays born as Shiites, uh, not, not converts to Shiism, but born as Shiites. And um, they, are <laughs> they are among us, as, uh, as they say in movies about... Uh, about um, aliens from outer space. Um, I just want to end and say that we ought not to fall into the trap that is being set for us by outside uh, powers that is dividing and ruling Muslims. 
Um, generally, it is uh, Muslim extremists, uh, particularly, not all, but some Salafis, who uh, demonize uh, uh, Shiites. The former Iraqi leader of Al-Qaeda, uh, Abu Musa Zarqawi, said that Islam has three enemies. The West, Sufis, and Shiites. Um, and this is being manipulated by various powers. These ideas being manipulated by various powers to divide uh, Muslims. So it's very important to, to, um, to guide against that. Um, there are a few other things that I would like to say uh, in terms of what we can do to um, bring the two groups together, especially in this country. I think maybe I'll reserve that for um, the question and answer session later. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farid. And I think uh, it's important that uh, you ended the presentation with the um, example from, from Iraq uh, from, uh, uh, that you cited, because again, it highlights the dimension of, of power. Uh, in particular, um, let's remind ourselves of, of what has just been, been discussed. We are, we are talking about stereotypes that are, are fictions, but they are instrumental fictions in the Edward Said sense. So stereotypes are hardly ever innocent. But they are not natural either. Stereotypes have to be constructed. So there is agency at work, and there are also ends to be met once these stereotypes are created, animated, given life, and they take on a life of their own. 